Camp meeting has been for me a beautiful experience. In my room, I've heard the children laughing. Yesterday, I went with a group and we talked about the beautiful thought that God wants us to simply come home and everything will be all right. And then this group, three of them stood up and sang. I would say that they were not professional singers, but it was profound and a beautiful experience for me. For they sang about the love which is deeper and wider and purer and better, the love of God. But as they sang, the tears started to flow from their eyes. One of the singers could hardly continue. They were singing about the inner experience and the inner love that they valued in God that God has for them. For me, it was beautiful. Pastor Eddie, when you stood up here this evening, that for me was beautiful. To see the way that we are stricken in this life and yet we can still talk about God and God leading and God guiding and God giving of his love. Pastor Eddie, that was a sermon for me. I'm longing for Jesus to come. I'm longing with a passion for Jesus to come. I'll never forget the moment some years ago, about 20 years ago now, when I was in camp meeting, youth camp meeting, and a pastor came up to the front and he sang the song that we sang earlier today the beautiful song. Um, I've forgotten the song. <laughs> anyway, you sang it earlier. And he stood at the front of camp meeting and he sa sang that song about the coming of the Lord and the beauty of the coming of the Lord. But what was so moving as he stood at six o'clock on that day singing that song was at 10 o'clock that morning, he had buried his 21-year-old daughter. We sat there and we, as he sang, the tears, all of us, it, the, the tears just flowed. He buried his daughter at 10 o'clock that morning. And now at six o'clock, he's standing there with a broken voice and singing this beautiful song. I'm longing for Jesus to come. I'm longing to see the glorious skies open with the presence of Christ and the magnificent glory. This is the ache, this is the longing, this is the passion of all that know Jesus Christ. They love the cross, but they long to see the Christ of the cross coming in great power and in great glory. In Mexico some years ago, or Mexico as they say, one of our churches decided to visit a prison. And they worked with the prisoners in this prison. And over many months, maybe a couple of years, they shared the good news of salvation and the great truths that are so precious to us as a church. And eight of those prisoners on death row decided to become Christians and become Seventh-day Adventist Christians as well. Arrangements were made for these men to go and be baptized in the local church. It was about eight miles away from the prison. But the prison authorities agreed that these men could leave death row, they could go uh, to the church, and they could be baptized. These men were political prisoners. 
They had killed, but they were political prisoners. The day came on that Sabbath and these men were taken to the Adventist church. There was a guard, several guards, several trucks going along with men with rifles. And they all piled into the church and the whole day they worshipped and praised the Lord. And then came the baptism. It was a beautiful and a wonderful day. And finally these men were taken back to prison. The members of the church prayed, surely that now they have come to Christ, Christ will work a miracle. Surely there will be a repeal. They will no longer have to go through with the death sentence that they're facing. It was only a few weeks after that that they, taught, they were told the death sentence is not going to be lifted and they were to stand before the firing squad. These new Adventists formed up on the appointed day before the firing squad. The local pastor came into that yard and the men were standing there eight in a row, the new Adventists, hands tied behind their back, blindfolds ready. And the pastor went to the first man. And as he went to the first man, the pastor choked. The awful thought, this new brother in Christ, in a few minutes he's going to die. And the pastor was so choked emotionally, he could hardly speak. He could hardly get out of anything. And this wonderful new convert to Christ, he stood there and looked at the pastor and he said, don't worry, I'll see you in the morning. The pastor moved to the next man and again the pastor was choked and he couldn't speak and the man just looked at the pastor and he said, don't worry, we'll see you in the morning. And the pastor went down the whole line, man after man, and he could hardly say anything to the men in that row. Just uh, muttered, bless you, we love you. And each man looked at the pastor with his head held high. And he said, we'll see you in the morning. Don't worry, pastor, we will see you in the morning. Every man in the line, we'll see you in the morning. The day when Jesus comes again. We will live again. The pastor moved back. The rifles were lifted. Blindfolds placed. And eight men dropped. Their life on earth ended. But men who dropped with the last words, We'll see you in the morning. Don't worry, Pastor, the day when Jesus comes again and raises the dead back to life. I'm longing for Jesus to come. I'm longing for that glorious day when we will be linked again with the ones that we love. And tonight I simply want to ask you if you'll permit me to describe that glorious day to share with you our understanding as Seventh-day Adventist Christians that beautiful day, the day when Jesus will come back and meet those who have the blessed hope, who are thrilled with the blessed hope, who are in, uh, enamored with the blessed hope, who are energized blessed, by the blessed hope, the people who long for the coming of Jesus Christ. Permit me to remind you what we believe on this matter. We understand that the people of God, as the close of probation comes, will be a people then scattered. It will be the time when the people of God will be driven into the caves, into the forests and into the mountains. 
The people of God will be the people that then become the people victims of the time of trouble such as never been before. The people that are going to go through a period of trouble that the world has never ever seen before. The anger and the ferocity and the wickedness of the world will be turned upon the people who love the coming in a way that is almost un unbelievable. Because this will be the period when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. And for that short period, the people of God will be standing by faith in their blessed hope of the coming of Jesus Christ. But they were in their caves and in their forests and in their mountain places. They will be a people that will pale with what is going on on the planet but they will also be a people who will be lifted up by the promises of God's words. Isaiah said, in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 29 and verse 30, You will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival. Your hearts will rejoice as when you go up with flutes to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. The Lord will come to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire. The clouds will burst, thunderstorms and hail will come and the world will see the glorious, wonderful coming of the Lord, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. With the shout of triumph, the voices of evil seem to have gained the victory. When suddenly and spectacularly, this world will be plunged into darkness. Darkness is but the removal of light. The world is going to be plunged into darkness because the light has been taken from the world. And then this world, as it's quietened and stilled, as the rebellion is checked, in this dark world, suddenly we have been told there will be this tremendous rainbow, this most beautiful rainbow, the covenant of promise, the promise to the people who live with the blessed hope, the people that long for the blessed hope. The people that long to see Jesus coming in glory and power, suddenly in the midst of the crisis of the great troubles that they're going through, from the prison cells, from the caves, from the mountains, and the places where they have disper been dispersed, the people will know that this is now the beginning. This is the time when Jesus is going to come again. This is the time that they've been longing for with a tremendous passion. And as they see the wonderful rainbow span the sky, we have been told that they will be told to look up for your salvation draws nigh. And they will actually have the same experience that Stephen had. The experience as his life was being crushed out as the time of trouble came to his life and his life ended on the earth, Stephen looked up and through it all he saw the Son of Man sitting on the throne. He saw his Saviour. He saw his Redeemer. He saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we have been counseled that when the world experiences this darkness, when the world sees this manifestation of the glory of the Lord and the symbol of the rainbow, the people of God scattered on the face of the earth, they will look up and they will see the Lord and they will know that the Lord is about to come for his people. Oh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the most wonderful, the most glorious, the most inspiring, the most satisfying, the most joyful, the most stunning day that this world has ever seen, especially for those that can look up and see Christ and say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Come, Lord. Amen. Oh, yes. At midnight, we've been told, the power of God is seen. The sun begins to shine at night time. 
signs and wonders follow in rapid succession. But in one part of the sky there is a radiance and a glory. And from that part of the sky a voice says, as in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 17, It is finished. It is done. That voice energizes a tremendous power upon the earth. And we have been told that this voice shakes the heavens and the earth. There will be a mighty earthquake such as there never was. The glory of the Lord will begin to flash through and the winds will begin to rise and mountains will actually begin to shake. We'll look at the Everest range. We'll look at the Alps. We'll look at the Rockies. Wherever we are on the planet Earth, the voice of the Lord has declared this is the end. There is to be no more. There is going to be no more rebellion. There's going to be no more rebellion against the things of God. The King of kings and Lord of lords is coming to take his people home. And even the earth is beginning to shake at the power of Jesus Christ who will come in great power and in great glory. Ragged rocks scatter on every side. There is a roar and the sea and the waves begin to uh, break in fury. Whole earth, the whole earth uh, heaves. The surface of the earth begins to move as though the foundations of the earth are beginning to fall apart. The surface of the earth is breaking up. Mountains are sinking. Thick clouds cover the sky. The sun breaks through now and then. Fierce lightning flashes across the sky. The earth is wrapped, as it were, in a sheet of lightning. The time has come. The awesome time has come when the voices of rebellion, the voices of persecution, the voices that have refused to bow the knee to Christ, tragically, the time has come when they will stand in terror of what is happening. The tragedy is, as we said last night, no one needs to be eternally lost because they're a sinner. The only reason people will be lost because in sin they rejected free pardon. They do not need to stand in terror of the coming of Jesus. The Word of God says in Isaiah chapter 2 and 10 to 12, Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. Men will flee to cover, cower, uh, caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from the dread of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. My friends... I could weep. Not one of these people that will find this experience terrible needed to be in that place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whom so ever. The heartbreak. The heartbreak of that moment. Instead of being a moment of joy, a moment of victory, a moment of release. Oh, tragically, it's a moment of terror. But for the people of God, the psalmist describes that glorious day. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. The Lord is our refuge and strength, 
our ever help in the time of trouble. Suddenly, the clouds sweep back. And there is seen a hand holding the law of God. And the law of God has letters written in light, golden light. And there for the whole world to see is God holding up the standard of his love. Tragically, there will be those looking at this wonderful law, the people that said it is legalism, the people that said we're saved by grace but not by law and were correct, but made the awful mistake that though we're saved by grace and the blood of the Lord and it is a gift of salvation and it cannot be earned by keeping the law, we are saved to live the law because the law says, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and your neighbour as yourself. I read in your New Zealand newspaper today that there has been a racial killing in this country. It happens many times in my own country. Sadly, a young lad, as you know, just about two years ago, walking home from school, attacked in a little stairway in a housing estate. The next minute, the lad is dead. Over and over again, we see this hatred and we see this violence. But the Lord is holding up the code. The code that says if the world and the nations would obey this code, there would be no killing. There would be no hatred, there would be no war, there would be no envy, there would be no greed. The nations would live together, neighbours would live together, because the love of the Lord would be supreme, and the care of the other more important than the care for ourselves. God is not holding up this law in order to condemn, although that's the result. He's holding the law up before the world and saying, why did you reject the code of love? The letters are in gold because it's the code of love. And there in the final events, God will hold up this law and the world will see that if only it had kept the law of God, we would never have seen a grave on this planet. Then the voice of God is heard declaring Jesus coming to his people. Suddenly the announcement is there and the people of God know that this is now very close to the time when Jesus will come to in great power and great glory and great majesty. It is the time of the blessed hope the hope that the people have longed for, the people have yearned for, the people have prayed for, the people have cried for. But I want to tell you the greatest reason why Jesus is coming is not simply to put down the nations of this world. It is sim not simply to put down the evil that is in this world. It is not to sort out the problems of this world. The Lord is coming because simply he wants to come and be with his people. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. My friends, I believe we make a mistake when we interpret the coming of Jesus as the primary reason to subdue the nations and put down evil. Yes, that will happen. But the primary reason for the coming of Jesus is because Jesus himself has a longing to be with the people who have the blessed hope. The people that are longing to be with Jesus, Jesus is longing to be with them. And when the Lord comes in this moment of power and glory and majesty and might, his primary reason, he simply wants to come for his people he wants to come for me and he wants to come for you. I repeat, Jesus is coming for those that yearned for it, 
hoped for it, prayed for it, and cried for it. Jesus is coming because I long for it. Jesus is coming because I yearn for it. Jesus is coming because I pray for it. Jesus is coming because I have cried for it. Jesus is coming because you have longed for it. Jesus is coming because you have yearned for it. Jesus is coming because you have prayed for it. Jesus is coming because you have cried for it. About four years ago, I sat on the bed of a very close friend. Someone that is strapping and strong. Tremendous muscles. And as I sat on the bed and put my arm around him, I could feel his shoulder bone poking through the skin at the back. He took his shirt off and he showed me. He was like a victim of Belson. My dear friend was dying of cancer. He died. But before he died, I asked him, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart? And he said, absolutely. And then he said, not the exact words, but it was very much, I am longing for Jesus to come. I am yearning for Jesus to come. I have cried for Jesus to come. I have prayed for Jesus to come. Dalbert, I will see you in the morning, the resurrection morning. And whatever happens, be faithful and we will be, be together. My friend is resting in the grave. My tears watered that grave. But my heart is longing for Jesus to come. Because when Jesus comes, I will meet my friend again. Soon in the east, there appears a small black cloud, about half the size of a man's hand. In the distance, it is shrouded in darkness, but the people of God know that this is the sign of the coming of Jesus. Oh, friends, I just, just don't know how I can express the excitement I feel in my soul for that moment when on the planet, wherever we are, whether we're in prison, whether we're in caves, whether we're in the high places, when we're wherever we are, suddenly we can see in the distance that small black cloud. And we know that this is the coming of Jesus. This is the Lord coming in power and great glory and majesty. And there's going to be nothing on this earth that can stop the Lord coming to this planet and taking his people home. There's going to be nothing to stop in him meeting the people who have longed for the coming. Jesus is coming. The cloud is getting bigger and bigger. And as it comes closer and closer, the glory of the Lord just begins to embrace that cloud. And high above the cloud, we have been told, again there is the rainbow. And as the cloud comes nearer and nearer and near to the earth, we stand there in awe. We stand there in th uh, thrilled with this moment. This is my Savior. This is the one who is worthy. This is the one who redeems redeem me. This is the one that made everything possible. This is the one that forgave me. This is the one that loved me. This is the one that died for me. This is the one I'm longing with a passion to see and now Jesus is coming. I believe the people of God across the face of the earth, they will be looking at the cloud but they'll be looking to see the face of Jesus for the first time. The face that died on the cross in agony 
will now be coming in the clouds of glory. And as he comes in the clouds of glory with majesty, he comes with love, he comes with triumph, he comes with victory. He is coming with the absolute certainty that his people are going home. And we stand there on the planet and we look and we look and we look as this marvelous moment gets larger and larger until finally we see the Lord high and lifted up and we see Jesus alive for the first time since he left this planet 2,000 years ago. My friends, I don't know whether I can convey the excitement of that moment. It's a crude illustration, but let me give it anyway. In over a week's time, I will go back home. And when I walk into my home, and my wife is standing there, maybe she'll be at the airport, and I'll walk, you know, through the barriers, and I will see her face. That moment of seeing the face of the one that I love, that will be one of the most beautiful experiences. To see the face of the one that you love deeply and passionately, it is a beautiful and a wonderful moment. Those that have the inexpressible joy for Jesus Christ, we will look into his face, you will look into his face, and we'll see his face formed in the clouds of heaven. And for the first time, we'll say, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. The king is here. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. And we'll stand there thrilled to meet Jesus Christ and see him face to face and hear that wonderful call. Come home, my people. Enter into the joy of the Lord. It is going to be the most wonderful moment. It's a moment to sacrifice everything for. It's a moment to get rid of the impediments of this life, the desires of this, this life, the riches of this life, the things that are not necessary in this life. Because that moment is more joyful and more rich and more precious than anything this life can give us. It's the moment when we see Jesus face to face in wonderful power and in wonderful, wonderful glory. In solemn silence, the people have, on earth will watch that cloud getting closer and closer and closer, growing in glory, base of the cloud burning like fire, rainbow of covenant above, above it. We have been told by the servant of the church, no human pen can portray that scene. No mortal can conceive its splendor. The skies will be filled with the radiant forms of the accompanying army of heaven. 10,000 times 10,000 will come with the Lord and thousands upon thousands. It took one angel to roll the stone away. Now the army of heaven has come. They have come because they too want to take the people of God back to the land of glory and to the land of promise. This is a moment of excitement for them also as they come and hear that wonderful call. Come home, my people, and everything will be all right. Habakkuk says, His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise and his brightness was the light of this world. High and lifted up, every eye sees Jesus. My friends, tragically, it's not just the eye of the redeemed. Every eye will see Jesus. It's the eyes of the theologians that denied him. It's the eyes of the politicians that ignored him. It's the eyes of the acad uh, academics who disowned him. It's the eyes of the philosophers that believed their wisdom was greater than the wisdom of the Lord. 
It's the eyes of the scientist who said, no God. It's the eyes of the atheist who said, I do not believe. It's the eyes of the agnostic who says, I choose not to believe. It's the eyes of the religionist who deny the divinity of Christ. It is the eyes of those that have denied the honor and the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. They too will see this great and glorious moment. But for those that believe in the Prince of Life, as they look with their eyes upon the face of Jesus, this is the moment of glory and this is the moment of passion. He is the resurrection and the life. He does not come back with a crown of thorns. He's coming back with a crown of glory. He's coming back with a crown of majesty. He's coming back in a dazzling display of splendor. And the arguments against Christ are now finished. There is no further argument. Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He is keeping his promise. He said he will come back and restore this world to its former beauty. He is keeping his promise. No one can begin to discuss. No one can begin to argue. No one can begin to doubt. This is a moment of absolute. This is an absolute that will be there for the rest of eternity. Every eye will see him. And finally, every knee will bow and worship him who is King of kings, Lord of lords, the Lamb that was worthy and slain. Amen. Oh, yes. The King of the universe descends. The heavens roll back in marvelous power. The earth trembles before him. Every island and mountain is moved. The psalmist looking forward to this day said, Our God comes and will not keep silent. A fire devours before him, and around him the tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Those who deny Jesus are now speechless. From the wheeling and reeling earth, the flashes of lightning, the roar of thunder comes one of the most marvelous moments, the moment that I'm longing second for. The first is the longing to see Jesus face to face, and the second longing and the yearning, the one that I prayed and cried for, is that marvelous moment when Jesus says, Awake! Awake! Awake ye that sleep in the dust of the ground. And suddenly the graves across the world in every nation and kindred and tongue and people, the graves will begin to open and the people that died with all the diseases and all the accidents and all the aging process of sin, they will come from that grave and in a twinkling in the moment of an eye they will be changed and they will ascend to meet the Lord in the heavens, the Lord face to face, the Lord who says, Come, my people, come home with me, and enter into the joy of the Lord for eternity. Among that group will be, I believe, my mother. My mother was a beautiful person, And all, all her life, see, she used her hands particularly to glorify God. She made the most beautiful things with her hands. She painted beautiful things. She etched in glass beautiful things. She sewed and embroidered beautiful things. She etched in wood beautiful things. Always beauty was coming from her hands. She made the most beautiful food. And her hands round my neck were the most beautiful thing. 
But toward the end of her life, her hands began to close up with arthritis. Her body was wracked with arthritis. In the final months of her life, as a family, we did everything we could to try and ease this crippling disease. We sent her here, we sent her there. We tried this device and we tried that device. And finally it came to the time when we could do nothing else. And my dear sister-in-law living over in Germany with my brother is a professional nurse. And as a professional nurse, we asked her, would you look after mum? In fact, she said she would look after mum. And so my brother came to England. I drove my mother down through England to meet my brother in the southern part of England. We transferred my mother from my car into his car. I kissed her and she left. I never saw her again. In Germany, my lovely sister-in-law cared for my mother with love day by day and hour by hour. We would ring her almost every day. And then on the wedding anniversary of my father who's still alive and my mother, the 60th wedding anniversary, I rang my mother and told her how much I love her. Down the phone she could hardly speak. My brother took gently the phone away and started speaking to me and he said, Dalbert, we think mum has not much longer to live. I asked, how long? And he said, well, we think five or six weeks. And the phone was put down. One hour later, I picked up the phone and my brother with a voice, tears in his voice, he said, Dalbert, mum's gone. She was cremated in Germany and brought back to the UK where we had the funeral service. I'll never forget that moment when after the service we went to the cemetery and I, being the eldest son, opened the boot or trunk of my son, a brother's car, driven from Germany. And there was a little urn, just a little jar, the remains of my mother. And I carried this jar across the grass among the graves to this little spot and placed the jar in a little hole in the ground with a memorial stone, the name of my mother and when she died. That moment of carrying my mother and the placing of my mother in that grave, it hurt deeply. Awake, 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 ye blessed of the Lord. The marvelous cry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the graves will open. And when the graves open, the dead who have died in the Lord, they will come forth. And my mother, I believe, will be among those. And she will rise from that grave. And as she rises from that grave, suddenly her fingers are open. Her flesh is young. Her face is young. She's not scarred by the rheumatism. She's free of this curse. She's bubbling and alive and her fingers are there able to make the beautiful things once again to the glory of the Lord. 
the marvelous moment of the resurrection when the lost are found, when brothers and sisters are brought together, where husbands and wives are brought together, where children are brought together, where the people of God are brought together, where the people that have loved the Lord with all of their heart are brought together and they will send to gather around Jesus Christ and be taken to that land of glory and there they will sing the praises of the redeemed and the song of the Lamb for the rest of eternity. That moment on planet Earth, awake, awake, awake. That moment when I will see my mother again because of the Lord. You will see your loved ones again because of the Lord. I will see my friend brought down by cancer once again because of the Lord. There can be no greater joy. There can be no greater thrill. There can be no greater experience in the whole history of the universe. And it will be a song that we'll sing over and over and over and over again through the rest of eternity. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Amen. And, oh yes, the marvelous moment will come. This is the true rapture. This is the true moment of tremendous joy. Come ye blessed of my Father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I'm sure you've thought of it. But you know, you know what that statement is actually saying. Come and inherit the kingdom that I had already put in place before anyone on this planet had sinned. The Lord is longing for his people to come home. And before the sins of this world and before the fall of Adam, before the foundations of this world, the Lord had already play, uh, put in place this place of glory and light so that he could bring his people home. For over 6,000 years or more, the Lord has been waiting to bring his people home. And he's taking them and he's gathering them and we'll meet the Lord and we'll go through the wonders of space and we'll come to this kingdom of glory and light and majesty. And the Lord will stand there at the gates of this wonderful city, this land of promise, this land of eternity, this land of safety, this land of glory. And he will smilingly say to the people that have lost their lives in the blood of the Lamb, he will say, come home, come home, and every Everything will be all right. Inherit the kingdom I have prepared for you before even sin came into this planet. This is the Lord that is coming. This is the Lord that is coming in great power and in great glory. And with wonderful love, Jesus welcomes his children home. Come home. Come home and everything will be all right. Then, the marvelous moment. As the redeemed come home, the first Adam meets the second Adam. We are told that the first Adam, when he arrives at the home that has been prepared, he will look around and he will actually recognize the very trees that he tended and that he lost through falling away from grace. He will actually see the very garden that he knew. And suddenly as he turns and he looks at Christ and Christ reaches out to him with those nail-pierced hands and the two come together and embrace we are told that the redeemed will throw their crowns before the Lord and they will bow before the Lord and there will be an anthem of praise and an anthem of worship that the world has never experienced. It will be the anthem of worthy is the lamb that was slain. Amen and oh yes. 
and I and you, we will bow before the Lord. We will throw our crowns before him as the human race comes together in Jesus Christ and we praise and worship the Lamb and we'll join in that glorious song and I have declared that I will at the end, even if I'm the only voice in heaven, I will say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Amen. And there will be at least one voice that says, oh, yes. This moment is glorious. This is why I'm longing for it. This is why we're longing for it. This is why we are the people of the blessed hope. This is why we are the people that are united in the blessed hope. Because we realize that this world has nothing to offer in comparison with the glories that are to come and the delights that the Lord has prepared for those that love him. He has said, the eye hath not seen and the ear hath not heard and it's not entered even into the imagination of those that love the Lord the things that God has prepared for them. The cross of Christ will be the song of the redeemed forever. As the nations of the saved look on their Redeemer and see the eternal glory of the Father shining in the Redeemer's face, as they see the throne with his everlasting, which is everlasting and no end, they break into song again and again, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, and he has redeemed us to God by his most precious blood. The mystery of the cross explains all mysteries. It will be the anthem of praise forever and ever and ever. Maranatha, Jesus is coming. It is the blessed hope. We'll see you in the morning. This is the love and the passion of the redeemed. May it be your passion and my passion for Jesus' sake. Amen.